Welcome, David Frum. Welcome, David, back to GMF. My name is Thomas Kleine Brockhoff. I had the Berlin office of uh, GMF, and full disclosure, I've known David Frum for nearly 20 years. So, once again, welcome, David. Uh, today Thank you we so much, Jen. I'm so sorry to be with you virtually. <laughs> yes. Um, so, Today, we want to talk about your most recent book, Trumpocalypse, Restoring American Democracy. And that is, I would say, call it the second part of a duology uh, on Donald Trump and his, uh, and his presidency. Uh, David's first book of this cycle was Trumpocracy, the Corruption of the American uh, uh, Republic, published in 2018. Um, this is I would say one of the first books that tackle the issue of the Trump legacy that looks beyond Donald Trump, um, that talks about course correction, that talks about what, if any, uh, reckoning there should be, uh, even of atonement, uh, the, of reform, of course, and the reclaiming of the center. And I think that is what we want to talk about that I think is what is interesting over on this side uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, to introduce David Frum um, is to say the formal way to introduce you is to say that you're a senior editor at the Atlantic Magazine and a political commentator. But of course, you're much more. You're a public intellectual, a conservative public intellectual at that, and a leading voice of the of the Never Trump movement of the right. Um, 15 years ago, I would have introduced David as a neoconservative. Today, I would see you rather, and you can correct me if I'm wrong there, as a, as a moderate conservative. Um, when I first met David, he was a speechwriter at George W. Bush's White House. David Frum was educated at Yale and Harvard universities, have held several positions at several positions at well-known conservative institutions, the Wall Street Journal's editorial page, the Weekly Standard, the Manhattan Institute, the American Enterprise Institute. Today, I would say David Trump is in an interesting place. In the one hand, on the one hand, he's an anti-Trump figure crusader, you might even say, and at the same time, he's a voice of reason and moderation. Interesting combination. And he proves that these two things can go together. So what we want to do here is we want to talk about the book, give David a chance to expand a little bit on the major themes of it. Then we will have a conversation with uh, the group of participants. Uh, and uh, the way you can chime in and ask a question uh, is through the chat function. And please indicate uh, that what question you want to answer, write the question. I can then combine questions if, if there are several. So to start us off, um, David, you write, uh, the current troubles will wreck the Trump presidency. The United States yeah. will shortly, and I'm quoting here, be swinging on a social and political pendulum far, far away from Donald Trump and far away from Trumpism. What type of pendulum swing uh, uh, do you foresee? What, expand on the on um, the theme, because here there is also the the idea that Trumpism is for good. This is what America is now. Yes. Um, I, I thank you, Thomas. I, I've had the uh, pleasure of talking to German audiences um, about Donald Trump before, and I have noticed a bias to project the future is looking like the past and to believe that Trumpism is the dawn of a permanent new era. Even before the pandemic struck, um, I, it seemed to me unlikely that Donald Trump would be reelected. And of course, the, the pandemic makes it almost impossible. Nothing is literally impossible. The shock of the pandemic has been so much worse here than on your side of the ocean. Um, both, uh, you've all seen the figures about the disease, the impact on the job market, on people's livelihoods. We've done a terrible job of putting a floor un under people. Um, and meanwhile, private businesses have been receiving bailouts of millions and millions of dollars, and you've seen those, those stories as well. Um, so there is a very strong anti-incumbent mood. Donald Trump was never that popular to begin with. Um, I think 
um, and you can see the sweat forming on the foreheads of Republicans in the Senate and the House as well, and the states too. And uh, you write, there is an age of reform coming. And I quote again from, from your book, just as Watergate was followed by a surge of reforms in federal and state government in the years 1974 to 78, so the Trump period seems likely to be followed by a new area of political reform. But the reform so you propose, electoral reform, the end of gerrymandering, and a whole host of others would require bipartisanship. But what we're seeing now is a partisan backlash, not bipartisanship per, per se. The reforms I, I've tried are about... To write Go ahead, David. I've tried to write Trumpocalypse. I'm sorry. I, I, I've tried to write in a mood, mode of realism. And I don't think bipartisanship is something that you are going to see in the United States. Um, I think uh, the Republican Party is in the grip of reactionary and even anti-democratic ideas. And that grip will not relax fast. So everything I write in the book is with a view to the two years where I expect Democrats will have a lot of political power, both at the federal level and at the state level. And the things I recommend are things they can do without Republicans. Um, uh, some of them are, are political reforms. Um, you do, the, the filibuster, which m means that you need 60 votes in the Senate, not a majority of 50 or 51, um, that can be done on a, on a party line vote. Uh, making a state out of the residential areas of the District of Columbia to add more urban representation, that, that can be done on a party line vote. Um, requiring more financial disclosure from future candidates from office, that can be done on a party line vote. The most important of the reforms that's coming is the Democrats are going to do well in the states in 2020. And 2020 is also a census year here in the United States. So there will be redistricting in 2021. And they can, oh, the jerry, there's always been gerrymandering in American history. I mean, the, the word goes back to the 18th century, so the, the early 19th century. So that, so that tells you how long we've been doing it. But it became very extreme in the 21st century. And a lot of the safeguards on, on gerrymandering were removed by the Supreme Court. Um, the Republicans went in 2010 in directions that had never been seen before, and Democrats have an opportunity in 2020 to undo, on their own, without Republican buy-in, to undo some of that and make both the state system and the federal system more representative. But if, if that is the case, and the Democrats can do some of those things that you recommend themselves, how are you going to get to what you also propose, some sort of recon societal reconciliation? a policy that is geared less to the extremes, but more to the middle. Yeah. Um, that is done through society and culture. But let me, here's, here's the, my view of the Republican Party and, and um, how you have to think about it realistically. Uh, the United States is one of the longest functioning constitutional systems, and that means our constitutional system is in many ways very old fashioned. Uh, the right to go, vote is very weakly protected in the United States. I mean, we have constitutional amendments dating back to after the Civil War, but on a functional level, there is no such thing as a constitutional right to vote. So parties have often gamed the system to prevent people who think differently from voting. And the Republicans have gone in a very extreme way that, that as the coalitions have changed in the United States, they seem to have decided instead of like Tony, uh, the history of political of parties is parties get out of touch with voters and then reinvent. Uh, that uh, British Labour reinvents with Tony Blair. The Democrats reinvent with Bill Clinton. Um, uh, after Oscar Lafontaine, the, the German Social Democrats reinvent. George W. Bush tried to reinvent Republicans in the early 2000s. But since 2010, Republicans have taken the view, just because we're outnumbered doesn't mean we have to lose. Instead of changing our ideas, we're going to stop the other guys from voting. And that option has to be removed. And only when Republicans accept that, they, that everyone's going to be voting, only then will they begin to reform and rediscover a more democratic consciousness. And, and, and these electoral imbalances, if you, if, if you could expand on them, what have they done? I mean, you write at one place in, in, in the book, uh, it's not about the will of the people, but it's to elevate some people over others. Yes. Um, the, the essence of populism in, in any democracy, and this is not a uniquely an American phenomenon, 
populists are, peop are people in politics who distinguish between people and the people. That everywhere where there's a populist movement, they have a view that there are true Hungarians, true Finns, uh, true English people, true Germans. Um, and those people may or may not be a numerical majority of the population of the state, but somehow what happens to them matters more. And look, I. I see this all the time when I'm in Germany, that I'll meet journalists who are just back from trips to Ohio or Pennsylvania or um, someplace with a, a, with a grain silo and cows and rusting steel mills. They would never go to Santa Monica uh, because even they agree that somehow there's something more essentially American about the parts of America where Americans do not live than about the parts of America where Americans do live. Mm -hmm. And 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 help us help us understand so sort of the project this this forward. At one point in the in the book, you 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 gained the idea of what if Trump was reelected, and then you had a a president the the uh, for the third time in four Republican presidencies in the in the twenty first century, uh, where the electoral college would make the difference, but would not yeah. would not with a mandate of of. Uh, of the population itself, and you quote Norm Ornstein in, in demographic projections that 30%, I'm gonna quote this year, 30% of, of, uh, of the US population by, by no, I'm sorry, I correct, 70% of the US population by 2040 will live in 15 states and the remaining 30% will live in, the, in 35 states, which means by way of the representation in the Senate, these 35 states have 70 seats. That's a pretty big. Uh, that's a pretty big majority. Yes. If you you can't govern against, so project if you could that forward your thinking on how this will work and what type of friction this will then cause. Well, uh, there is a famously witty American economist named Herbert Stein, who taught what he calls Stein's first law of economics, and that law was if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. So it's not going to go on forever that 30% uh, of the country governs 70% of the country, especially when that 30% are poorer, um, le less connected to the world economy than the, than the 70%. So we are, going, we are going to have an adjustment. And one of the tasks of conservatives in politics is to know when change is coming and to smooth the change by timely concessions. Because if you don't get time, make timely concessions, you get revolts. Um, and I, I cite here the European experience after World War II, that the way communism was stopped in Europe was not by saying anytime the communists had an idea, you reject everything to do with the communists. Communists say the problem is unemployment. Okay, therefore we're for unemployment or else you're a communist. What you did was you said, these communists are gaining power by talking about things that matter to people. Let's take away their issues. Let's defeat the communists by stealing their themes. Um, and in the same way, in the face of this, these new populist insurgencies, I think we need to have the wisdom of the people of the 40s and 50s um, and to understand how you remove the power um, and, and restore the democratic idea by meeting people where they are, um, by acting in a timely way to make concessions. So that's going to mean in the Senate, for example, making new states, uh, making the district, the residential areas of the District of Columbia a state. It's going to mean getting rid of the filibuster so that um, the Democrats can sometimes have a majority in the Senate. Um, it's uh, going to mean um, making the House of Representatives more representative than it is today. That's supposed to be the representative body, and it's almost as um, twisted as the Senate. And it's going to mean restoring the democratic accountability of the president's presidency. When George W. Bush was elected by the Electoral College in 2000, he recognized that as an enormous problem. Um, and he did and tried to do things to broaden his appeal. Donald Trump does not accept it as a problem. He is happy to be the president of 45% of the country on a good day. So, in what makes the country ready for that type of reform? If you, if if uh, if this comes through an acrimonious uh, situation, an election that is close, that doesn't have a, a popular a popular mandate, how do you get there? Um, quite. Um, we're in a crisis right now. We're in um, worse unemployment than in 2009. Unemployment numbers that you have to go back to the depression. 
um, we, we are having a public health crisis that is going to smash our healthcare system. Um, the numbers, you've all seen how the numbers are arising. So far, the death numbers are mercifully lagging, but they will catch up with the case numbers. That just seems inevitable. Um, and um, as Americans lose work, they lose their health coverage. So we are having a situation where back in 2009, people lost health coverage to a terrible recession, but at least they were no sicker than they were before the, health, the, the crisis. Today, not only are they losing health coverage because they're losing their jobs, but they're sick. Um, and so we are going to have to have um, an expansion of the healthcare program. And that in turn is going to force po political changes so that minority groups can't stop it. It's very possible, for example, that in 2021, President Biden will be saying, um, I wanna talk about the pandemic and how we cover people during it. And 42 Republican senators will say, 46 will say, we, we have the power to stop it, even though we represent just cows and rocks. And in the face of the need for healthcare expansion, um, the Congress of the United States is not going to accept that 46, 47, 48 senators can continue forever to thwart a majority of the Senate and a vast majority of the country. Yeah. You also write that the uh, that these electoral imbalances that you criticize in, in, in the book have a have a Disprop disproportionate racial effect. Can you explain? Yes. Well, that's, that's what they were all set up to do, um, that the United States has historically coped with multi-ethnicity by um, denying the vote to people of disfavored ethnicities. Um, and, and even now you can see the, um, how much harder it is, how much longer um, Blacks have to queue to vote than whites do in, in almost every American jurisdiction. Um, so th this is part of a minoritarian movement to hold power. Um, one of the things that I've become very interested in in the Trump years is the history of Germany in the years after World War II. And how do you restore a democratic consciousness? It's easy to write, to write a constitution. It's easy to pass laws. But how do you restore in a population a sense of these are things that it's fair and reasonable to do, and these are things that it's not fair? not reasonable to do. Um, and the story of West Germany from uh, the war until 1968 is the story of that rise of democratic consciousness. And we, I think, are living through something like that now. Maybe one of the most important legacies of the Trump years has been the movements outside party politics, first me to, to now Black Lives Matter, which are movements of social more than political reform. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um... I mean, you, you're, you're talking, and frankly, we've talked about this before, um, your interest in this West German experience. And the one thing uh, th that I'm, I told you at the time is how, how much can, can you actually use this as an example? But because the, the German experience is based on a complete moral and physical uh, defeat and an undoubted uh, authoritarian, totalitarian experience. None of that is true in the in the in the American case. Um, so the, the the question is, where do you draw the energy and the uh, and the direction from to restore um, democratic spirit and decency? Get away from what is now alternative facts. Yes. Um, look, history never repeats itself, and situations are different in different places. But this, the West German experience is proof that people in politics can be learning animals, um, that they can, that they can uh, rise above their um, – they, they can absorb messages. They can think about how, how to do things better. And they do that usually after some kind of trauma. Um, and the trauma doesn't have to be ex as extreme as the trauma that, uh, that Germany underwent at the end of World War II. Uh, but we are going through trauma in the United States now. Um, this, what is happening now is um, uh, it, it's a very strange experience because for those of us at the top of the social and economic distribution, um, coronavirus is more inconvenient uh, than the global financial crisis, but it's less of a shock. We, we've mostly kept our jobs. 
Um, and even though we are a little poor, our stocks are worth a little bit less, um, you know, we are a little bit poor in other ways, we also find our expenses automatically contract. We don't go out for dinner anymore, we can't travel. So the, the usual expenses of discretionary expenses of upper middle class life have been trimmed back. And most of us, are, except for the inconvenience and discomfort, are not so much worse off. Meanwhile, for the lower two thirds of American society, this is a catastrophe greater than the financial crisis um, with uh, unemployment in almost every family, um, loss of livelihood in almost every family and sickness and death joined to the loss of health insurance. So there is a mood building in this country that um, act on. And uh, the present government cannot because Donald Trump interprets everything through the one prism only, which is what does this mean about me? Um, and, this vi and, and he regards the virus as a kind of critic. And therefore the virus has to be ignored because he always ignores criticism. And so this, this pathetic pathogen, this microscopic, sub-microscopic entity, he's not going to accept bad news from it. He's going to pretend it doesn't exist. And he has led a whole party to pretend it doesn't exist and have these debates about how do we reopen the schools? Well, you can't reopen the schools if the children are going to get sick and their parents are going to die. In the chat function, I'm already see, receiving a number of, uh, uh, of, of comments and questions, and please keep them coming. I will, I will turn to you after having covered uh, two, more, uh, two more elements of David's uh, book, and in, in some cases, I will ask our, our colleagues to actually unmute a couple of the, uh, of, of the participants of this call. David, you uh, also want, don't only want to restore, uh, reform the system of government, you want to re reform conservatism. In one of the, uh, in, in, yes. in, in somewhere you write, the Republican Party has morphed under Trump into a party of white ethnic chauvinism. What happened there? Yes. Well, um, that is a story that I tell in great detail in the first book of the of the um, duology, uh, Trumpocracy. But um, essentially, what happened was that a message that was culturally and environmentally reactionary expelled from the Republican Party um, many of its traditional voters. Um, you know, parties of the center right across the world tend to attract the more affluent, the more educated. Um, uh, but those are people who also tend to be more culturally modern and more environmentally aware. Um, if you have a center-right party that rejects cultural modernity and rejects the environment, um, then you expel uh, those affluent educated voters, especially the women. And just to survive, the party then draws, dr uh, draws more and more on a base that is um, from the remains of the old industrial working class of the local majority. And this is true, we've seen this trend, in this way America follows patterns that you see in France and in Germany and in Great, in Great Britain, um, everywhere, where the, um, the, the grandchildren of the social democrats in the, in the days of social democratic greatness now end up in, par, in the National Front, in the Brexit movement, uh, in the alternative for Germany, um, and the grandchildren of former Christian Democrats end up in the Greens and the Liberals. Um, and, and we have the same phenomenon here, where the Democratic Party is the party increasingly of those with college degrees. Um, and the, the Republican Party is the party of the remains of the old industrial working class. And how does the Republican Party hold them? Because it doesn't offer those people anything of value, of material value. It holds them through cultural resentment. And what do you do to reform uh, conservatism? Tell us a little bit of how you think of how you would. I, this change, you would do that. this change will will not come from within. It will not come organically. It will only come from um, the experience of political defeat. And so Republicans need to have it made clear to them that they do not have the option of competing by shrinking the electorate. The electorate will be the electorate. Um, and, uh, and the electorates will be represented better and more fairly than it is today. Not perfectly, the American Constitution doesn't allow that, but more fairly. And so in order to compete, it's going to have to begin to think, where can we gain, gain voters? And that is going to drive it um, in new directions. And maybe it will move in directions I don't predict, maybe I'm guessing wrong, but uh, we have to see an end to these days where it's feasible to 
govern a great country over the objections of a 55% majority of that country. Um, I want to start moving towards uh, our, our listeners, and I want to ask my colleagues, Elizabeth, uh, to put on Johannes Alefeld, who has had already put into writing a couple of questions uh, on the electoral reform that I think is better for him to state himself than, than me paraphrasing them. Elizabeth, can you do that? Um, Johannes, you have to unmute yourself now. Uh, I've been trying. <laughs> Let's see. We can hear you. <laughs> yes, you can hear me. Okay, hello. Fire away, Johannes. Well, it, basically, it's two questions. One, you were refer referring uh, to provide for basically more proportional representation uh, by changing the numbers of, of the House for obvious reasons, because let's say a Senate, let's say two for all is, is kind of set. But let's say what, what, what is going to be the consequence, the kind of the imbalance uh, how you, are you going to do it? If 15 states are going to represent 70%, then probably also of the members of the House. You, you, you probably have to go a similar way as we in Germany in kind of raising the number of members of the House, or is that uh, basically impossible as a given? And then what does it mean if, if small states in the end, the East Coast ones, for example, are maybe going down to one, two or three members? It, and and yeah. what's, what does that mean in terms of, let's say, keeping in touch with the electorate in the future? That, that may have, yes. let's say, in those states, probably people will feel that the system has been rigged in an unfair way and say, that was yes. the one thing. Um, Let, let's, and, let's, uh, let's, have, uh, let's have David answer. If, 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 yeah, if, if, okay. Uh, uh, there are there are limits to what we can accomplish in the United States, especially in a very short period of time. So m my goal here is not to find the ideal answer to any problem, but simply to say what in the next 24 months could be done to make things better. So in the next 24 months, you could make a state out of the District of Columbia. And if Puerto Rico wished to become a state, which it may not, um, you could make a state out of Puerto Rico too. That would, that would go far to change the partisan imbalance of, of the Senate. Um, mm. you, uh, as you say, the rule of two per state is guaranteed uh, by the Constitution, and the extreme imbalance in population never before seen in American history, that's a function of the modern economy. I mean, just to put this in context, that the two Dakotas plus Wyoming plus Montana, four states um, have a population less than that of tiny Connecticut. Um, and if you throw in Idaho to make it five states, they have a population less than that of small Massachusetts. Um, mm -hmm. And so it is, it is just that extreme. Um, and there, mm -hmm. there are limits to what we can do, but, and bigger reforms will take longer, but there are some things we can do immediately. As for the House of Representatives, the 2021 census gives us a chance to make the House of Representatives less grotesquely imbalanced than it is now, um, where Republicans can win the House of Representatives is theoretically a representative body, and yet it takes the Democrats millions more votes to win a majority in the House of Representatives than it takes Republicans. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, thank you, Johannes. I want to turn to one question that John Kornblum uh, asked, and I want to put John on if we can, uh, Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, talking about what I framed the racial imbalances and uh, Hello, hi, can you, can you hear me? Hi, David. Hi, John, nice to see you again. Uh, I'm, I'm calling from, you. nice to hear you. I, I'm calling from Nashville, Tennessee, actually, where I have, my wife and I are sitting out the virus. And so I'm quite um, sensitive to the question that came up after the, uh, George Floyd was killed and the Black Lives Matter. I grew up in the 60s, I was a very, dedicated supporter of the civil rights movement. We've had an African-American president and every indicator shows that blacks are no better off than they were then, not really. There are more college educated, et cetera, but shocking is the reaction in the United States 
against the, the uh, interests of the African American population. Is this really truly an original sin that we're never going to get over? Or do you feel that there's some hope for the future? Well, when you say uh, black people are, are, are no better off, um, what do you have in mind by that? Well, I have in mind their income levels. I have in mind uh, the, just the simple thing of uh, how, who is dying from the virus. I have in mind in the treatment, I have in, in mind the police uh, treatment of black people. I know there are more people in higher education. I know there are higher earnings, et cetera, but still the social and cultural situation of the African-Americans doesn't seem to be a whole lot better than it was 25 years ago. Yeah, well, this, as, as I don't have to tell you, is an extremely complicated subject and a lot depends on, 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 how, you, on how you measure. Um, and I'm not anything like an expert on this, but there's a big difference, for example, whether you measure income by individual or by households. Um, black people are likely to live in smaller households. They're likely here to have one earner. Um, so if you compare earner to earner, the wage gap has closed. But if you compare household to household, it, the wage gap has, has not cool, closed. And certainly the wealth gap remains very, very large. Um, but I think, I, I mean, I was a child during that period, but I, if your adult mind re reaches back to it, I, it just doesn't seem right to say that black people are no better off than they were in, say, 1965 or even 1970. I mean, that, uh, that, that, that just, the whole um, movement of protest against police violence is a demonstration of a group that feels self-confident, that feels like their voices are heard. And I think it's very striking. Um, I was in Washington during some of the commotions and, and um, masked up and put on gloves and went down to watch them. It's very striking how much more orderly and peaceful uh, these movements were than the, than the urban disturbances of the 1960s. Um, how much more socially um, self-confident the people participating in them were. Uh, and um, obviously when you, you just could tell by the way people dressed and talked that the, um, you know, there in Washington, thousands of um, young black people were obviously college students or recent college graduates and who had been shaped by that. Um, so I, I think we need to measure the distance we need to go without minimizing the distance we've already come. There was one a, a question along the lines of the electoral electoral reform that you propose, and that is from David Masuka. Are not the states of California and Texas too large? Uh, would not a compromise be allowing them uh, uh, an even number of red and blue states of the former California and Texas? Yeah. Yes. Well. I, I am more attached to my idea of, of um, merging the Dakotas, Wyoming, and Montana into a single state of South Saskatchewan, as I like to call it here from Canada. But, um, but uh, tex um, Texas, when it joined the Union in the 1840s, in, uh, the Act of Union allowed Texas to subdivide itself into six states. And that would be a one, that's a trick that Red America has up its sleeve to maintain its voting power um, as, as the country changes, is that Texas could subdivide more easily than California could. All of that said, I, I want to make sure that we um, have time because I, I don't, I'm not super optimistic about the possibilities of political reform. It's social reform that interests me more. Political reform is powerful to the extent that um, it expresses that. So uh, many of the changes that I propose, and they're modest, um, in Trump apocalypse have to do with the way we organize society. Um, a stronger healthcare system to make people feel a stronger social bond one to another. Stricter immigration rules so that we um, preserve more social cohesion and have less of the disturbances that flow from very high immigration numbers. Um, and I, th I think we need to integrate um, uh, environmental planning deeper into our thinking. The virus has shown us, I mean, the, the, well, the virus, the coronavirus, it's not the Black Death. It's not um, the great influenza of 1918. It is uh, by, in terms of lethality, it is a moderate pathogen. And yet it has shut down, it has shut down all of our societies. Um, it has shown how, how um, our sophisticated, just-in-time societies with their vast global supply chains are very susceptible to shocks. 
And now you imagine the kind of shocks that are coming our way in the 2030s and 2040s from climate. You think it is so urgent now that we act on, on those issues so that our grandchildren are not sheltering in place because of some climate catastrophe. Now, David, you, you, I'm glad you're moving us towards these, uh, these issue area proposals that you make, especially on these three, on the three topics that you mentioned, healthcare, immigration, and climate. The way I read your book is these are middle of the road type um, um, reforms. They're in terms of immigration, not as open-minded and not as welcoming to, to, uh, to immigration as some Democrats would like to have it and not as critical of capitalism as in, in terms of climate as some progressives uh, might have it. How do, how, how do you rebuild the center around issues as you propose them? You make a very interesting proposal with regard to healthcare as to how you ingrain healthcare into, into, sort of into the, the, the popular, make it popular and make it a right rather than just another law. So if you could expand on that policy of the middle that you that yes. you uh, make as a topic in your book, you make it a topic. Well, well, this is a way in which American politics will be very different from German. Um, that uh, German politics is very focused on consensus at the middle. Um, for that, That's not the way the American political system works. The way we get to the middle is by um, veering from one extreme to another extreme and then learning from that ex those experiences. So my, my guess is what is going to happen is we are going to move in the 2020s, we are going to move pretty sharply to the left and in a more sustained way than we did in 2009, 2010. Um, and if the Democratic Party has some political success and is able to deal a, more than one defeat to the Republicans, uh, Republicans are going to have to uh, temper to adjust to this new political reality. Meanwhile, um, the strength of the left will increase within the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, Vice President Biden um, is not the dominant figure in his party that um, President Obama was in his time, just for a lot of reasons, including age. Um, and you will have a very activist wing in the Democratic Party that will push and push and maybe push in directions that most Americans don't want to go. Um, we had an example just this weekend where um, a Democratic senator, someone who's on the short list to be Biden's running mate, was unable to answer the question, should we take down monuments to George Washington? So if you can't answer that question, that tells you how much pressure there is from the Democratic left. So as the Republican Party loses, as the Democratic Party overshoots to the left, that's how we see the possibility of a new kind of conservatism and a new return to the center. It comes about through, not through conscious consensus building as it would in Germany, but through uh, the swings of the pendulum as it does here. <clears throat> That's a very interesting and, and also explanatory because it is very different how, uh, how in the two countries those, uh, those methods of political, uh, of political direction building, uh, so to say. Yeah. We have one question uh, that was asked earlier. Um, what happens if Trump loses and stays. Can you expand on that? Uh, on that, well, although I realize it's not we, in a part of uh, of the book, but I'm sure you have opinions to offer here. Yes. Well, I, I have participated in wargaming sessions where we've talked about these kinds of risks and their real risks. But it might be useful here um, to be more specific about where exactly the risk points are, and the, the calendar of the presidential transition becomes very important. So the, the vote will happen on the first Tuesday in November. Um, it's possible that vote result will be very decisive. Um, if it is, I think this question goes away. Trump will surely try to make the vote count indecisive, allege fraud, allege all kinds of shenanigans. Um, but if it's not close, it won't matter. But if it is close, he has then a month of opportunity. And the crucial date on the calendar here is December 6th. On, on the 6th of December, um, the governors of each of the states convene uh, their electors. And the electoral colleges, and these are actual, they're real human beings who do these jobs. So when you vote for a Democrat or Republican in your state, what you're actually legally doing is voting for a list of people who will cast, meet, come to the state capitol and cast an electoral vote. 
Um, so there may be a situation where in a close state, um, the, uh, you have the 13 Republicans and the 13 Democrats each saying, no, we are the real electors for the, the state of Minnesota. And the governor of the state then has to make, it's up to the governor to certify uh, one set of electors as valid or not. And there's some opportunity for mischief for some of the Republican governors. Georgia may be a place where there's mischief. There are other opportunities too. Florida could be a place where there is mischief. Um, once the electors are certified by the governors, opportunities for mi mischief sharply dwindle. Um, the, the next phase is uh, a month later, I believe, I'm not certain about this, I believe on the 6th of January, the slates of electors come to Washington, D.C. to participate in a ceremony uh, where they, the Electoral College votes. And this is normally a completely antique ceremony. It's they, you, they go into the con the vice president presides, they cast their votes, everyone goes to lunch, they pose for photographs, they go to the Smithsonian. But um, if you have some states, like a state like Minnesota, if it sends two competing states of elect, uh, if it doesn't decide, it sends two competing slates of electors, you could have a crisis on the 6th of January. But the mischief is greater at the state level on December the 6th. The mischief is more difficult on January 6th than Washington. Once there is a certified president, then there is no possibility that Trump stays. On, uh, at noon on the 20th of January, if Donald Trump has not been certified, he is not the president anymore. So even if he says, I refuse to leave, then we have a landlord-tenant problem. Uh, but he's not the president. The, um, the, the man with the nuclear football doesn't, answer, doesn't disappears. Um, the phones don't work. Uh, he's just not the president. He's just an unwelcome tenant in the White House. And I don't think he'll put himself through that embarrassment. So the, days to follow, the, day to pay the time to pay attention to is that period from voting day to the 6th of December. That is the period of danger. So we, we in Europe thought with hanging chats and all of that business, we'd learn, learned a lot about the American electoral business. And if the Supreme it. Court stepping in, now we might have a very different learning experience as if, if I follow your line of thought. I think we have time for one more mm -hmm. a, a question and for that one more. And I'm, I'm, I realize I have to cut off a number of people who've, who've, uh, who've kindly written, but I apologize. And to, for that, I want to turn to the international uh, 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 arena, and for that, let's turn to Daniel Hegedus. Put him on, uh, please. Uh, a succinct question, succinct answer, and I think that's it for this round of book talk. Um, thank you, Thomas, and thank you, uh, David, for the very interesting and insightful thoughts. Uh, my question would be that if we switch the perspective from the domestic arena to the international one, can we expect a return of the U.S. as a champion of democracy parallel to these reforms, for example, for, for the reason of legitimacy and the shared values, or these reforms will even occupy much more political energy and will make the U.S. more inward looking and unable to address challenges to democracy in its alliance systems, which are, in some cases, very similar uh, to the phenomenon of Trumpism. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Daniel. It's nice to talk to you again. Um, I, the damage done by Trump in international affairs may be larger and even more enduring than the damage at home. I worry about this a lot. Uh, and putting together the alliance system will be very difficult. Um, the when I worked in the Bush administration 20 years ago, the American economy was somewhere, depending on who was counting, between three and six times bigger than the Chinese economy. Um, today, the Chinese economy is, I don't know, 80% that of the United States. And within the decade, it will probably become approximately equal. Uh, the United States, not since the late 19th century, has the United States compete, um, had to compete with uh, an economic equal. And the, the last time we competed with an economic equal, it was the British Empire, with which we were very compatible in, in so many ways. Um, it's through the 20th century, the United States was effortlessly, and by an enormous difference, distance, the largest economy on the world. And it could then build alliance structures where there weren't a lot of questions about how are the bills paid, because the United States was so much richer than everybody else. We're moving into a 21st century where the United States will be 
somewhat bigger and somewhat richer than China, but not dramatically so. Um, and in which the only way it can balance China is by building coalitions of partners who are also strong and also rich. And the European Union should, should of course, have that list, but that's been, been, Trump has made that as difficult as possible and left a legacy of mistrust that will not be easy to overcome. So I think for all of us, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so happy to be here and why the work of the German Marshall Fund is unfortunately for you more important than ever. Uh, you know, organizations like to say our work is more important than ever, but when it actually is more important than ever, it really is frightening that to re-knit these ties of connection across the Atlantic, but to re-knit them in, in a new way where the partners are of more equal weight um, so that we can have a alliances based on greater equality than we've had in the past to meet new challenges from potential adversaries who are much more powerful in economic terms than anything we've ever had to face before. With that, I think we have run out of time and it's time for me to thank all of you on this call and all of you who've contributed through the chat function and your questions and certainly uh, David Frum for being with us. I'm going to hold up his book so you see what it looks like. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether we should want uh, the duology to be become a trilogy to get more of David Frum's thinking that, uh, that I, I, I certainly find very attractive. But I'm not sure whether it does require a, a, a second term of Donald Trump to get us to, to the tri triology. So I leave that all up to you. And David, thank you for being with us in this, in this hour.